I, Robert Campbell, Bertrand of Sydney, do commission you, Captain Frederick Hasselborough, of the Brig Perseverance, to certain islands on the coast of New Zealand or elsewhere, for the purpose of procuring oil, seal skins, or other animals or substances, the produce of the seas or islands. Mr. Murray. Unreal Engine February Marketplace Sale is officially underway. 
Browse through over 1,000 products at an incredible 50% off to find something for that special creator in your life or treat yourself to anything from cozy bistros and realistic fuzzy mammoths to vast landscapes and horrifying creatures of folklore. Shop these great deals through Sunday, February 13th on the Marketplace. Tens of thousands of monsters crashing down upon a carefully built village is the core that Age of Darkness Final Stand is built around. For Australian game developer Playside Studios, a dark fantasy RTS was a brand new challenge, but one the team approached with enthusiasm and confidence. On the feed, explore how they raised the hordes of monsters in Age of Darkness, their transition from mobile and VR to a hardcore PC RTS, and how they optimized that chaos. Digital twins are 3D models of physical entities with live, continuous data updating in real time. In our upcoming webinar, Visualizing Data in Digital Twins with Unreal Engine, we'll demonstrate how UE can be used to visualize this connected data and introduce the Microsoft Azure Digital Twin link for Unreal Engine plugin, and provide an overview of the accompanying sample project. We'll also explore how AI and particle systems can be used for compelling visual feedback. Register today for the webinar on Wednesday, February 23rd. In our first spotlight, step through a grandiose mansion created by Lorenzo Drago. All of the assets in the marvelous environment were self-built, apart from a handful of decorative patterns. Dance over to their art station page and let them know what you think. Next up, we're celebrating the work of Anderson Rohr. They've shared an awesome reel of their work in the forums, which includes projects with Learte Studios, Rock and Rio, NVIDIA, and more. Drop into the forums to watch the full video. And lastly, pick up your adventuring gear and head into the Fortress Ruins from Shan Tian. Inspired by Japanese anime-style game graphics, this scene was created to achieve that look and feel, and it looks fantastic. Head over to Shan's art station page and keep an eye out for future tutorials on the scene. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to this week's Inside Unreal. I am your host, Tina. Uh, I'm excited to have our guests here today. We have Andreas and Aaron, and they're going to be talking about Stackabot. Um, take it away, guys. Tell us a little bit more about this project and what you're going to be showing us. Yeah, hey, um, nice to be here. Uh, haven't been here for quite a while, and uh, we brought Stackobot uh, sample project we just released on the marketplace like Aaron when two weeks ago three weeks ago I yeah it gotta be like two three weeks I think yeah and it is a sample project we worked with a very small crew actually the crew is sitting here <laughs> it's Aaron and me <laughs> worked on, on the project and the idea was to do a small sample that's easy to digest but using all kinds of Unreal Engine 5 features but more from a kind of indie perspective so to have something really really small, um, but touching all the different features like word partition, lumen, nanite, uh, meta sounds, um, enhanced input, etc. So we, we actually tried to cram everything in <laughs> we we could get our hands on um, and um, yeah, release that as a marketplace asset and made the video. And now we are here and super happy to chat about it. So we, maybe this is a bit unusual chat, I don't know what the stream, but what we intended to do is just show a little bit and then hopefully have interactions with the chat. And if anybody has questions, just drop them. So we are not wait. We will not do a two hour presentation of something and then answer questions. I think it will go back and forth. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll keep this pretty light, pretty conversational. And uh, yeah, if any good questions come up in chat, we'll make sure to toss them out. <laughs> the first message already makes me oh, this is really that is really nice. I love the project. <laughs> Been using it with my son. Okay, so oh. done. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. There we go. We can wrap it up right there. <laughs> um, I think as well the um, you know we released the Valley of the Ancients demo, released the Matrix demo, and those are just these massive you know incredible projects. 
Um, so we wanted something that didn't look as good as that. Um, but more importantly, was a, <laughs> wow. maybe, maybe a bit smaller, um, you know, in terms of file size, something a, a little bit more supportive for multiple platforms. Um, so we hope that it's useful for, for people to pick apart. Yeah, absolutely. A slightly more accessible demo of some of those awesome features. So it's, it's really cool. My, my, my wife just left the house and we have a cat and it's six o'clock. And that means my cat comes into the room and is complaining a lot. So <laughs> I think, Aaron, you have to make the start and talk a little bit about it because I have to let my cat out. Otherwise, <laughs> he will actually kill me. So um, maybe we switch to Aaron and I will be back in a second. Awesome. Sure. Yep. So I think like the first big thing that we want to say is that, you know, the project is available on the marketplace. So if you want to download it, I think it's about a gig. Um, so if you've got it downloaded and open, then that's great. Um, if not, you could get it downloading now and hopefully you'll have it open in time uh, that you can do a bit of a play along with some of the features that we're going to be um, looking at. Um, and yeah, so I mean, we can we can just dig right into it. I think um, if you get my screen up, we can start showing some stuff. Um, we do have kind of like a rough rough script. Um, some of the stuff's going to be covered by Andreas, and some of the other stuff's going to be covered by by me. So just to give you a quick overview, if you haven't seen Stackobot before, uh, it's a full uh, engine project, um, but all it is is just like a little map, right? And you can run around it. You can collect stuff. Um, we've built a few little interaction systems, uh, and we've got this little uh, little robot character that can just run around. I'm just going to make sure my audio is down on this one a little bit more. Um, and you can run around, you can jump. We've got a jetpack. You can drop your character down, and it will um, ragdoll out uh, if you're moving. And if you stand still, you'll get it locked in. And then you can kind of jump on your your pre-existing character. So it's a way of you, you know, kind of being able to solve little puzzles and things like that. And then around that, we've created these little kind of, um, you know, play boxes where you can kind of run around, solve little puzzles, um, and, and yeah, kind of just get to grips with the game mechanics. Uh, but it's all been built using all of the new tech that we've got in UE5. So we've got Nanite enabled on pretty much every asset that we can have Nanite enabled on. We've got Lumen on so we can change our lights in real time and we'll get a nice kind of dynamic uh, you know kind of gi uh, update on those lights as we move around i'll just bring that back up again uh, and then we're using all of the new open world tools as well so um, inside uh, if we go over here you can see our world partition um, and in this instance because our map was so small um, we we've actually just got four chunks in total i think and we actually uh, just set our streaming sizes to load in um, pretty much everything because our, our map is, is small enough that we can do that. Um, but we've got world partition enabled. That also means that we have one file per actor enabled. Um, the character is using um, all of the new kind of uh, IK systems using control rig and things like that. So if I find a nice uh, uneven surface for our little robot to walk on, and then kind of start moving around a little bit. You can see that those feet update uh, their placement and as they move around. So we're going to go into all of this stuff in a little bit more detail, but I just wanted to give you uh, a quick rundown of all the different features that we've got. Um, we've even got some uh, dynamic sounds that are currently playing at the moment. You probably can't hear them because we've, uh, we've not got audio on, on this, um, but we've got it on Andreas's side, so he'll be able to show you. And then we've added and just a little extra quality of life features as well. So we've got some foliage interaction, so you can kind of see as the character moves around. We get a little bit of movement around uh, the grass where that character moves. And then as we get closer to some of the bigger pieces, you can see that we get that kind of, um, you know, kind of the foliage actually folding away from the from the player um, as they run around it. So yeah, those are pretty much all the features. Um, I don't know if Andreas is back yet and wants to take over. Yeah, I, I um, am. Oh, you are. Excellent. Okay. I am. I am. <laughs> so I've just okay, done yeah, a quick nice. overview um, while you're dealing with your cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I dealt with him. Um, yeah, cool. Nice that you... So the question is where you want to start. I think we can start with, with an enhanced input 
part. Um, mm -hmm. But again, uh, if you're in chat, just ask questions. If you want to know something particular, we can go into any detail here. Um, but we made a list of stuff we want to tackle. So um, first up is, uh, I can show that on my screen here, is we used enhanced input systems. So there's a normal input system in Unreal Engine where you go to project settings and you have inputs, and then you could do all your mappings, access mappings, action mappings, etc. But if you enable the plugin for enhanced input, and then switch the default classes here, uh, gives you the opportunity to use the enhanced input system that comes with two asset types. One is the input action, like for example, we have a jump here, um, which looks really familiar to what you had before in the project settings. So I can say this is a Boolean, for example, but in addition, you can have modifiers and triggers here. Like I can have fourth negates, a smoothing. So you have different modifiers or even triggers um, you can add here. Um, and then the second asset is the input mapping. So in the input mapping, I do what you know from the project settings. We say, okay, I have this uh, action now, and now I'm binding um, the E key or the game uh, face button left in this case. But also when you go to uh, the controller, uh, you, you have my, my thumbstick X axis, for example, for moving left and right. And then I have a modifier in this case for a dead zone, so I can modify the dead zone um, um, of, uh, of this axis. So this is how I configure it. And when we take a look at the character, which is under blueprints and then character, I have this little bot here. Um, when he gets possessed, um, you can tell the player controller what mapping to um, map on that. And this is actually a pretty nice part because you can change the mapping um, when you, for example, switch to driving a car or something with your controller, then you change the whole mapping. Instead of having everything crammed into, into one big setting, you can separate those uh, inputs out. When, as it's assets, you can also use uh, something we didn't use here is the game ability uh, plugins, the, the game feature plugins. So now you could put this an extra plugin with the inputs and then load them in when when needed. Yeah, so that's that's one advantage. And the other one is when you take a look at the input node, so here's a jump again, um, I have much more control uh, w what I want to react on. So for example, for the jump, if, if the, the jump starts, uh, in our case, we check the movement and then we say, hey, if you're walking, um, then we want to jump. If you're already in a falling or in a flying stake state, we toggle the jetpack. And now we have an execution pin for ongoing, when the button is, uh, for, for whatever reason, canceled, if it's completed, while it's triggered, and you have much more, uh, uh, you have more access to different um, uh, values. Like, for example, elapsed seconds. This is something we didn't use in this project, but it gives you much more control about uh, over your inputs, which is pretty nice. Yeah, that's uh, that's the first feature we kind of used. And I think it could be. Um, it was definitely a bit of a stumbling block for me when I first did, when I first opened this project because Andreas had already been working on it for quite a while. I went to go and look at the um, input system. I was like, oh, none of the inputs are here. <laughs> so um, if you're wondering where the inputs are, yeah, they've been moved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I must admit, when I saw it the first time, I was like, hmm, should we really use it? It looks more complicated. Before that, I just had it here. I, I, I wasn't the biggest fan when we started, but actually while working on that, it really gave you so many different ways to like, I mean, as I said, we didn't completely leverage it here, but, but again, some of the features like, like Aaron already said, for the word partitions, there's not really a meaning in this project to use word partition to stream stuff in and out because the level is much too small. But on the other hand, as a project is very small and very digestible, it gives you the opportunity to test around with it, learn it, and then apply it to much more complex uh, things. And with the input system, it's a bit the same. Um, so so when you when you think about it and, and think about like, okay, if I have different control schemes and I can load them in and I can load them out and I can do that dynamically, I could even, if you think about an online game, which means you can 
uh, not just update the project settings uh, each time you make an update to the project, but saying like, oh, uh, is this a season or whatever? We, we, have, uh, we have a car, we have, I don't know, you can ride a dolphin, so we need another input scheme. Then you just do that and then, then you load it in when needed. Yeah, I, yeah, maybe I really we can like take a look at the. Uh, at... Sorry, I was just going to say like I, I was working on a game um, that had like three different methods of moving, and you end up with having like accelerate and jump and whatever, all basically tied to the same named event, and then you have to be like, okay, what am I going to name this event? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another that's another good topic. And then you end up with something like action one, action two, action three, mm -hmm. and when when you come back to your own project half a year later, you're completely lost. Yeah. I saw some some questions of this came in, so maybe we go through the questions of the enhanced input before we move to another topic. Yeah, mm -hmm. there were a few pretty good ones that came in. I did see someone was very curious about um, if you could show off the foliage material a little bit more. Oh yeah, we will. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Should we do you want to do that? Let's, now? let's first see. Maybe we should just I saw that there are some about input, so maybe we just go through those and then we move on to the next We have that on the list, so we will definitely uh, touch that. Sure. Um for enhanced input, is there a place they can get with the different events that come off of the input action or defined as? I'm not sure if I understand the question. What's the difference events that come off? I'm yeah. I'm not getting the question. Maybe maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that, Dragon. Did see a question about uh, how you would debug the new input system. Oh, you debug it the same way as before. So I mean, at the end, uh, when using it. You have the events and that are triggered. So if I make a breakpoint here uh, and then play, so if I jump, um, I have my breakpoint. So it's it's the same. There's no big difference. Um, yeah. Anything else? I think maybe the first one was just asking about you know kind of defi like defining what each of those input types are going to be um, in which case we like we, we might be doing some slight renaming from the five early access to the five release um, but hopefully those should be reasonably self-explanatory and then we've got docs planned for all the new features that are coming out so um, if it's not updated yet inside the uh, inside the docs page, then it, I'm sure it will be soon. Yeah, I, I think that's important to know um, it is still in beta. Um, I mean, we used the early access version like everybody can use out there. So um, uh, there's stuff that will be changed in the release version. Uh, there's stuff that gets improved, etc. So it's not completely settled. And that's also the reason why some of the documentation uh, is uh, either very small or not completely there because it's not production ready yet. Um, so and for, for the for the I, I think I saw the question, how, what what can you um, what can you define uh, for those? So when we go back to the jump here, for example, you can say something like, OK, if this is triggered, it consumes. So all the stuff, you know, um, and then the value type, for example, are the different accesses. So in, in our case, we use only the 1D axis, so for left, right, or up and down. Uh, but you have a 2D axis or for, for even more fancier input systems, a 3D axis. And then you have the triggers, like, like for example, you can say if it's hold or down or hold and release, so you can, um, you can have those and they are pre-configured or modifiers, like I, I said, like the dead zone, uh, or like like smoothing the input out a bit, etc. cetera. Um, I haven't used all of those yet, um, so I'm not completely aware when to use what. Um, yeah, that's it. I did see another question about um, how you would set up the inputs for multiplayer. Yeah, again, that's that's pretty similar to how you would do it um, 
uh, how you would do it in Blueprint with, with the old system. You have to be aware, I mean, these little symbols here tell you what, what's happening. So event possess comes um, from, uh, from a server call. Um, but the app mapping and uh, that's uh, is only happening on the client, so you have to be careful where to do the stuff. But that's basically uh, similar to what you know how to do Blueprint uh, or same in C plus plus. You have to be aware what's executed where. So the controller um, is replicated, but the UMG stuff, for example, and the input stuff is is not. Awesome. Very, very good stuff. I'm not seeing too many more questions on inputs specifically at the moment. So we could uh, move on to another feature you guys want to show off and maybe a couple more come in. And we can backtrack to those. Yeah, sounds good. Or do you, I mean, we do not have to stick to the list we made. So if someone asking about the interactive foliage, maybe it's a good thing. I hand over to you and you show the intact, the grass and the, and the fern. Yeah, sure. Um, we can we can load that because it's a it's a, it's a pretty quick one, so it'll be a nice uh, nice breaker. Um, so if you bring my screen up, um, we've got uh, so there's like a number of different ways of doing foliage interaction. Um, we wanted to go with a nice simplistic approach, so something that was very easy to implement. Um, so the route that we ended up going down, I'll just open up the material here. Uh, I've said that, and now we've got a bunch of uh, bunch of blueprint code. But basically, all we do is um, we just make sure that's going to cover the screen correctly. Uh, basically, all we're doing is we're using a material parameter collection to to set the player position, right? So one of the things that we don't get um, in the material editor, even though we can get the camera location, we can't get the actual player location. So if we want to know where the player is, then we need to set that information manually. So the quickest way of kind of getting some reasonably decent looking foliage interaction is to feed that player position into a parameter collection like we've done here. And then because this is uh, going to give us a vector four, we just have to mask it to give us a, a vector three. And then we can just check the world distance between our um, our inputted location, so our player position, and the world position of the grass. Um, so with that distance, we actually get a, a gradient running out. If we divide that gradient by 100, then we basically get that value range down from 0 to 1 based on a distance of 0 to 100. And then saturating that value will clamp that value range. So saturate is just a, a you know a clamp, but always does it between zero and one. Then we invert that value. So instead of it being um, zero being the distance closest to the uh, closest to the player, we have it the other way around. So we have zero coming out and then one coming in, and that means that we have an area of effect um, for our for our grass. And then once we have all of that information, that's basically our, our mask information for what should and shouldn't affect the grass. We then can figure out how we want to move that grass, right? So in this instance, what we want to do is we want the grass to kind of push away from the, uh, from the player. So we don't want it to just kind of like flatten down necessarily. We want it to kind of splay out around the player's location. So in order to do that, we do a uh, subtraction of the player's position from world position, and then we normalize that. And that will basically give us a, a nice radial um, vector um, coming out. We have the push strength, which is going to be the amount that that grass moves. Uh, and then we add a negative value, which will just kind of push the grass down a little bit. So what we're doing there is we're, we're pushing out in the vector away from the player, and then we're pushing down a little bit as well. Uh, and that's going to give us our, 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 our power. So if I, uh, you know, kind of mess with some of these values, like I take the character push strength and I set that up to, let's say, 400, uh, and I'll just save that. And then press play. Just going to run through here. As we move through the grass, you can now see that that push value has has increased quite a lot. So we start to see kind of a much 
um, much crazier grass movement as we go through. So the only downside to this um, this value change is that it's it's a single value, right? So it's only going to give us um, that that value between zero and one around the immediate location of the player. So if we wanted to expand on this, um, we would need to you know kind of start looking into a render target, and that way we can basically input a texture into our material and actually have a fade over time. So we can have the grass immediately affect, and then as the player kind of carries on walking, that grass very slowly starts moving up rather than the immediate uh, effect that we've got here. And then we do the same thing for, for these ferns as well. So uh, if we just have a look at the uh, fern material. And I'm just bring that so it's the right position. We've got our tree base. So in this one, I've kind of put it inside a function just so it's it's nice and uh, and out the way. Um, but we use a very similar process, right? So we create a sphere mask around our object, uh, and then instead of doing a a flat move, I actually rotate about the axis of the um, of the fern. So that way we get that kind of movement from the pivot point, and it rotates around. And then we use that gradient running up the fern to control how much that falls off. Um, so that way we get that nice, um, you know, kind of that, that nice bend effect on the on the foliage. But you can see the principles are very similar. We're getting the position, finding our distance, um, doing a comparison against the object position, um, and then you know, kind of doing a little bit of maths there to rotate the the actor around the object. And yeah, that's how we did the foliage. That was awesome. Personally, I think the grass looks great, just flying all over the place. That's a great little touch there. Yeah, one of my favorite things to do is just make it mosh because you can, um, you know, you can control the up and down movement on it. So if you just set that to really aggressive, then the, the basically <laughs> just looks like it's in a mosh pit. <laughs> it's just that. I love that. I think that should be the default, personally. But uh, yeah, I think so as well. But some people like the more natural kind of grass moving in the wind effect. Mm. They're wrong. There's, but there's one subtle thing I personally like on the grass. Uh, I can show here that Aaron did, and maybe he he forgot or he's not mentioning it because it's obvious for him. But what I what I personally really <laughs> like is it has this kind of nice metallic look. So if if I move the camera, if you if you can show that here. Um, if you move the camera a little bit left and right, then you can, you can see it has this kind of slight metallic uh, uh, look. It, oh, wow. It, did you just do it with, yeah, with we want it. is it just, yeah? It's, yeah, it's just, I mean, we've just got a, a mask in there that, that we're plugging into the, into the metal channel and tweaking the roughness slightly. We wanted to have something quite, uh, you know, the organic stuff to look a little bit inorganic, um, just to match with the robot um, and kind of some of the, the rest of the environment. So um, we kind of played around with some, um, you know, kind of some different ways of doing it and having these little kind of like feeders with little chips on the end kind of made it look like it was, you know, kind of it was a more cyber styled uh, grass rather than more traditional stuff. Yeah, there were two things we started the project with. The first was, okay, let's let's do a nice character and let's do something special with it. And then we, we were we were discussing we were discussing quite a lot how much what what should we do to to make this to to, to make this special. So we were thinking about a unique feature, and then then we came up with this like, okay, how would it be if we can if we can print a new one? And then then we did that, and we didn't even have. Um, uh, a concept art yet for him um and then but then we came up with oh if you if you can print a new one then it would be nice if you can stack them so it, it um so we started with uh with stretching that out and while we were doing that we were discussing like okay it's a bit it's just a sample project but we both made games before and i think when you make a game you want to know a little bit the background story, and this is actually as small as this is. This has a background story. So our idea was like, okay, um, it's 
it's terraforming um, and it's like robots got dropped into this planet and they have to prepare it for their makers. They don't know who their makers are, but they they kind of just left there. They can print stuff and they should build this terraforming machine so um, um, so the, the, the planet can be changed. And um, that was kind of a, it was really loose. It's not that we really went really deep into that, but it gave us always this kind of, um, yeah, when, when we were designing uh, things, it gave us a little bit of, um, of, of guidance. And that's, Okay, it's an alien planet. So when when um, uh, when Aaron joined, uh, our uh, foliage looked first a little bit different. We did different experiments, and then it was it was really nice. This kind of uh, we had this robot. We have the colors of the robot, and then having this kind of alien, but not too alien um, vegetation. I I really loved it. Yeah, I think you guys found a really great balance where it's, you know, recognizable as obviously foliage, but it gives a nice alien twist to it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can go to the bot. So here's, by the way, here's this, uh, here's the part where at event tick, where we do several other things like updating the camera and handling the jetpack. Here is uh, the set ve vector parameter value where we feed the position into this, um, in this parameter collection that Aaron just mentioned and the, um, uh, and then is used, um, uh, for the bending, but it's also used. Um, it's also used for uh, for the printing effect. So we, that's a nice thing with the parameter collection. You can just there's no complicated communication between different systems. We just here we write it into a data set, and then we can read it wherever we we, we need it. Uh, that was that was handy. Uh, no, we didn't discuss the background music yet. It's also a topic we want to go to. So, any any questions around the foliage? Otherwise, we we uh, can move on maybe with the uh, with the character itself um, a bit. I did see one question pop up where someone was curious if the same system would work with a more realistic grass as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's you know. It's just the kind of like that simplistic movement away. Like I said, the only downside is that it's it's just an area of effect around the player at all times. So um, there's there's no fall off or there's no real kind of fall off as the character moves through. So if you've got some like really tall grass that your character's moving through and you want to go for realism, you, you almost definitely want to go for a render target so that the character has kind of displaced that grass and then it stays that way um, either persistently or semi-persistently um you know kind of as they kind of walk through and that way they can they get that nice trail behind them as they go through i think we did actually do that for the um the you know yeah. the chicken demo yeah. we did um we we have got that in there so that one has a niagara particle effect which literally just spawns like a um that you know kind of that outward vector and that gets fed into a render target so um, if you download, I think it's on Unreal Online Learning, there's an accessibility talk that has a little chicken in it. <laughs> and if you if you get that project, then it's um, then I think we've got an example of it in there. So if you want to have a download, you can do that. And the funny thing is when when uh, when you join the project, that's something you did first. So we actually had that. Uh at the beginning here as well. And that was interesting thing with this whole project. We always had to kind of balance between, is it too complicated? Is it already too complex to follow? Because you can easily go really crazy, especially us where we know the engine quite well. And then you begin to do something like, oh, it would be also cool to add this and this and this. And actually there were a point in the project, like, I don't know, three months ago or something, like in November, I remember I was, um, removing more stuff than I was adding uh, because we had the feeling it, it went a little bit too complex for uh, for what we wanted to achieve. So we really wanted to have this feeling of, hey, you can fit each feature on one page. Like you have one blueprint and you just zoom out and then you see everything that's needed for it. So it's better to learn. It's it's always, it's very easy for experienced people to go too deep and like making it very, very complex. And then it's super cool and it does all the crazy stuff. But on the other hand, the downside is it's 
it's actually more harder to get into to understand etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah that's the reason why i said okay let's let's forget about the grass is remembering where it would be cool to run around and you see the trail where where you went with your character because uh, uh, the grass is um, is flat there um yeah but for us it felt a little bit too much so we said okay it's fine if it's just moving we wanted to have this interactive feeling for the whole for the whole project it all looks it's so all weird enemy. as well like if, you, if you don't if the grass doesn't move around the character it just looks really odd so, um, <laughs> that, that, that was actually black. yeah that was actually a, a pretty weird thing so when when i started the project i was working mainly with a robot so we got the robot in i tried different ways to do a unique selling point so to say so what you normally do when you do a game you find out what is the specialty of your game we wanted to have something like that so we tested different things and we ended up with this you can print several ones and then I had that, and then I said, okay, let's do a little bit of physics. So you can st move stuff around, you can press a button. So it became more and more, you got more and more the feeling that there's interactivity and it's vivid and stuff is reacting. And um, that was shortly before Aaron joined, um, the grass weren't moving. So, and we had, we had big fern stuff, but it wasn't moving. So it really felt off, felt off in the moment because all the rest was so interactive and so like fun and you could explore and you could test stuff, but some stuff felt just like static. So that was yeah. a moment where I, I actually asked and begged Aaron to help me to make this bit better. I'm not a tech artist. So. Uh, he brought in all those uh, all, all those foliage and also we added more Niagara effects like we have um, I can show here so it's it's subtle tiny things but it, it, it really helps to sell the point so we have the steam for example coming out of this events that's another one or um, a really cool one maybe you can show that because I think we haven't shown that one is the dust that is blowing around here and there um, so like like those Aaron, can you show those we haven't we haven't talked about them at all i gotta go i gotta find them first but <laughs> but yeah let me, <laughs> let me track you down the project but, I mean, it's, too one big, of, so. it's one of those problems right where if you raise the bar in like one area suddenly yeah. every other vertical is like well we should really do it for that one as well um, yeah, yeah that that, be that actually became a problem to a certain point because also when we we will talk shortly also about the food correction we did uh, which which is pretty cool but it also uh, uh, it went to some problems we didn't anticipate because of this high interactivity it, it had there we go i don't know how well that that's coming out on the screen i'm getting some weird artifacting going on as well um but yeah, if I open up the particle, silly screen. You see, we haven't prepared uh, that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So so basically, all we're doing right is we're triggering. We've got these wind markers. So so in this instance, I'm actually using. Uh, I don't know how well you can see those. If I just turn off orbit, um, and I'll pause it. So we've got these little white markers here. Now we don't actually render those. So we have the sprite render and we just disable that, um, which is really interesting, right? The concept of using particles that you don't render to give you data for other particles. So with these ones, we wanted kind of like that nice kind of wispy uh, swish kind of running through. Um, so we, we needed to get a nice trail, but we didn't want to have to um, you know, kind of derive that trail manually. We just wanted to throw out the particle and then let it let it figure it out. So we basically created these wind markers, which spawn out at kind of a set interval, and they've got a little bit of movement on them to kind of give you that random random spacing. Uh, and then we do we get our uh, location event generated from that, and then the actual trail itself that we do render um, that receives that event handler and generates the the spline points for um, for the ribbon renderer to use. And that's how we get that nice kind of like trail moving forward and we get those nice wisps. Uh, and then we added in just some extra dust motes and stuff like that, just so we can get a little bit more volume and kind of like that kind of grainy uh, noise in with the in with the effect. 
Awesome. Yeah. Since we're so, on yeah, that... the Niagara systems, there actually was a question that popped up um, about is is it possible to add MetaSounds to any of your Niagara systems? That's a good question. Um, I know that they're exposing more more stuff, so you can. Um, I'd need to double check. I, I know that you can you can expose events to to Blueprint that can be triggered by uh, by Niagara. So you can definitely run it that way. I'm not sure if they've added audio uh, checks in there yet, but you can, you can definitely create events from them. Chris Murphy did a pretty good uh, talk about that. There's a feature video on the Unreal Engine channel. Maybe we can find that. Uh, it's called From Minigun to Metasound or something. I'm, I'm not sure. It's it's about Unre Metasound and Unreal Engine 5 is is the title plus something, something. And he is actually touching that. So he has, he has Niagara particles reacting on music and sound. Um, so there is a data connection, but I haven't used it. Yeah, but there's. I, I highly recommend that that uh, that uh, little video. It's half an hour, and he 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 shows some stuff there. It's a good little yeah. find there. Yeah, but this is really these are really good examples of the stuff that actually we added later, where we saw that cool. The robot is doing stuff. It feels interactive. We have physics. We have all that, but the whole environment feels a little bit dull and not reactive. So. Yeah, I think it's when you work on a game, I think it's important to think about which level of detail you want, because when you put it in one area, then people expect to have the same level of detail in other areas as well. Yeah, for sure. It definitely becomes a little a little glaring when one section isn't quite up to the same par as everything else, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I think one other thing I can show, and that maybe goes also also in the next topic, is um, is is the the food IK we did here. So we had this robot. We have some animations. I can show a bit um, how that is done. Uh, but what what we are really happy with is the additive food placement. So it's not destroying the animation when he's walking over over something, but he's placing his feet properly. And it's not in the most in in the most videos you you find. And the easier solution is in the moment he stops, the feet get placed. That's what you normally see. Um, but uh, what we are doing is we are playing uh, we are playing the the walk animation, and then we blend into um, we blend into the foot position that we trace on the ground, um, and we do this additively. So the closer the, the feet comes to the ground, the more it's blending into Ike, and um, uh, I first show you how we did that, and then I can show you uh, uh, also where again this level of detail um, uh, plays a role. So we have uh, for for our character we have um, animation blueprint which we try to make very modular, and um, the whole project has extensive uh, comments because we not only wanted to tell what's happening here, but also why we choose uh, why we choose this. Um, so we we do ground locomotion, for example, and that's just the walk, run, and idle blend. Um, and then we cache those this pose, and then we have the whole air locomotion, which is the um, which is the whole jetpack thing. So that you can jump and that you can land, and then we have different lands like landing and going into idle and landing and running. Um, and from jump, you can go and fall, and when you are in jump. Or when you fall, you can go to starting the jetpack, and then we have a loop animation for hoovering. And then um, when uh, the jetpack is switched off, we go to to end jetpack, and then then go to land. So the cool thing making this with cached pose is that if I want to test only a certain part, and I see something goes wrong when I run around with him, I can now just decouple here and just say like, just give give me the ground. Um, the ground locomotion, and I only feed this in. Um, and now he can only walk, but I can. So he, he, um, he will stay in this. In this, so you see, he's he's not really playing anything else. But I isolate my problem, and I can just debug it that way. So um, for that reason, this whole setup is extremely 
uh, modular. Um, I personally like to 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 work that way. Um, so ground locomotion, air locomotion. Then we have a slot where we play a montage in. In our case, it's when he presses a button. Um, but this upper, we call that upper body because we have a layer blend by bone. Uh, and what we are doing here is saying like this upper body pose um, is only bl uh, blade on the yeah so to say <laughs> on the upper body so only pelvis and uh, four bones up uh, and actually his right and left leg with minus one we said don't don't play it there so this is that setup and here's when he gets um, in uh, in inactive mode um he's, this is a very good example of something that were more elaborated like in november um because you could actually reactivate him at one point but then you have to um, the animation graph has then interaction is not like a bool. it's not like hey you are not interactive or you are interactive then you can have different states like it's uh, in air interactive or whatsoever so it's very different um a different thing so that that made the graph too complex and we said okay for now for us it's fine that you abandon him print a new one you cannot go back to him and then we have the control rig which does the food placement and that's something i would like to show because actually uh, not too big um what we what we are doing to do to 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 blend the animation so um let's briefly go back into into for example the run animation so when we take a look at the run animation that's it so if we wouldn't do the food placement um uh, and i can i can actually show that by just bypassing the control rig here for a second so let's bypass that and if i would run around now uh he's not he's not uh he's not placing the full feet on the ground and then you have this kind of situations here maybe i show that a little bit bigger here. So then you have the situations here where he is uh, having half feet in the air, etc. Uh, yeah, and and that's um, and that's the reason why we used now uh, control rig. So let's plug that back in. And that goes there, and this goes there. Um, and in the control rig, what we are doing, we taking the incoming pose, and we have uh, our hierarchy here. Um, and then we have only, in our case, uh, for, for the food placement, only two controls are important. We have a food IK um, control for left and right. Uh, so they are those. Um, and what we're basically doing is we're taking the food position, so the, the bone uh, food L and R, left and right side, and we, uh, we move our controls where it is in that frame. Um, and what we then what we do is uh, we use a function. It's a really nice feature in early access that you can uh, that you can have um, uh, functions. So we have a trace uh, offset, and what this basically does it takes this position here, and then we use um, uh, we use a sphere trace. So we trace from a little bit above the knee uh, downwards, and when we hit something we take uh, this Z value um, where we hit the ground. Um, and then uh, using this very handy interpolation node here um, gives us the opportunity that he is moving our value towards where we want. And you can even change the increasing or decreasing space. So if I go inside, um, it can have a different space than if, uh, if I move away from that. Um, what we also do is, our hit not we take the, the, the from the hit we are having on the surface we take the normal um and as an uh, axis we use uh, z up so we, we we are trying to get the rotation um, um of the hit so um yeah we use this a mass uh, to get the rotation and then in, in the graph uh, we just save that for the left side as a z value offset and the rotation where the food, how the food would be placed. Um, and we do this for both sides. And that's actually all we do. We use the full body IK, have the bones uh, left and right. And then we take um, uh, the IK uh, control we have here, we placed where the feet is. And then we add the rotation and we add this offset. We slowly interpolate in, in that. So that's that's basically it. And, and in this way, 
um, we figured out a very lean way to um, to blend into that without uh, having any extra curves or any uh, other data we are needing. So um, yeah, and that that gave us this nice this night without destroying his his animations. Um, this nice way to blend into it. And it holds up very well. I mean, you have edge cases. So for example, if I move him really slowly to an area here where the, uh, maybe you saw it, um, we, we, we tried to minimize the issues by finding magic numbers at work. Um, but here, for example, sometimes it can happen that he's <laughs> exactly doing this. So that's again, that's a question about how how much detail do you want to add? Um, in our case, uh, we went quite far, but then you have, have really something like that. And then you have to begin to think about, oh, what kind of trace do we need? Um, how, how do we trace that? Do we need different collision for that? Um, because this can look hurtful. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a bit what I wanted to show about the, um, the full body I key and the control rig. Um, so he does he does a little bit more than what you normally see, um, but it's still not too complicated. The character controller on this one is um, is is actually straightforward. When you take a look at the third person template, it just adds this full body I key uh, thing, and then we separated the different um, state machines um, to, to to keep it a little bit more contained and um, a little bit more modular. That's awesome. That was a really cool kind of intuitive way to skirt around some of those really common animation issues, especially with the feet there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And normally if you do it, it b before I tried here, most of my characters always had this issue that I like, I do the trace when he stops and then you position the feet and then it's kind of snapping into it. Um, and I, I don't know how many different setups I had until this one worked very well. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's also, again, it, I think it's a question what you, what you want and how much, how, how deep you want to go. And something I learned here during working on that, it's also a danger to go too deep <laughs> in some areas because it needs, it pushes you to go deeper in other areas as well. Yeah, the age old enemy of development is scope for sure. <laughs> Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's not only like sometimes you think about scope is um you make a list of things you want and this list is too long. Uh but but something that's also true is by accident your scope exceeds because uh you you and also the viewer or the player gets expectations you raised by going uh, going too deep in one area, and then you have to adjust in other areas. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or one idea just requiring so much more work in other areas too, without expecting it yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was is also a bit special with this project is I, I made a lot of game gems, and um, uh, before I joined Epic, uh, I, I was working on several other games. Um, that got released and what was different with this one with all the others it's you didn't just make it and then leave it and then it's it's like oh we solved it it's fine let's go to the next problem here it was like oh we release this so people will watch what we do <laughs> there so you cannot fake it so you have to be extremely accurate and then comes okay it, i do this within it has an epic umbrella so it's kind of official so i cannot just like I, I, I had three or four different areas in the project where, for a normal project, have would have said completely fine. I can ship with that, and here <laughs> that was not an option because you had to say, okay, if I, if if someone sees this, <laughs> this is not best <laughs> practice. <laughs> so that was sometimes a bit of a challenge. Yeah, no cutting corners for this one. <laughs> All right, let me see if anybody had any questions about the animations that you guys were walking through, because I know that system was really neat. But while I try and track some of those down, um, any other points related to that that you guys feel like sharing? 
I think we can jump to something. I, I think it's good that Aaron and me just switch back and forth. So we can maybe, Aaron, what, what do you think about showing the room plug in your mate? Because that's something we actually haven't shown in the overview. And yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's um, very cool. It's, and it's, it's, that, it's, a hidden, just... it's a hidden gem in the project nobody knows about. I've just prepped this. <laughs> so we got to my screen. Ah, um, perfect. <laughs> I've actually got it ready. <laughs> ah, perfect. We um, didn't speak so about that. Your, it's really um... your natural your natural streaming instincts. Let me know. <laughs> um, so so yeah, when we were when we were looking at you know kind of uh, level building for this project, um, this was reasonably late in, and we we kind of wanted some originally some more puzzle boxy things. Uh, so we ended up prototyping a little blueprint that let you create these small rooms. We actually only ended up using it inside this little central space here that's got a few of the, the demo tools in. Um, but we, we left it in because it's a cool little feature um, and it, it shows off the kind of stuff that you can do with blueprint, which you know I always, always love doing. Um, and we've also got a nice example of, um, of plugin content as well. So this is actually stored as a plugin that you can enable or disable inside the project. Um, and you can very easily transfer it from one project to another, right? So that's that's kind of what makes this, this so easy. And all it is is, um, is it's a simple square uh, room builder. So, so you basically have this single blueprint and it creates this, uh, this little room. And we can scale it in and out, and it will kind of dynamically, um, you know, kind of scale the the room size that you've got, and make sure that all the pieces stay the same. So, on the on the right inside the description, we have the kind of the target cell size that we want to work to, and that allows you to use different modular pieces. We've got a wall mesh, a corner mesh, um, we've got a window mesh as an additional option, and then we've got floor meshes as well, which we can which we can add in. So you can really quickly kind of swap out assets, uh, and I do have a little kind of selection of um, other assets here that you can use instead, just to kind of show you how those um, how those work. But I'm, I'm just going to stick with this one for now. Uh, and we've got a, a number of different tools that we added in. So we've got the scaling, so you can kind of quickly kind of snap out these rooms and kind of put more uh, more together. And then because obviously we want to be able to let the player walk between those doors really easily, we added a door feature as well. So this door is a, another blueprint and we can kind of put these in here. And if I rotate this round, I want to put a door in over here. All you need to do to get this to work is actually to just snap it next to it. So um, the way that this is kind of working is that it, it figures out where those doors are. And if it lines up with a wall piece, it will subtract two of those wall pieces uh, wall pieces out. Let's do just a slight adjustment here. Uh, and then we can put another one in on the, on the opposite side there just to make sure that we're, that we're matching. And that way you have these nice kind of like interactable, um, you know, kind of room sections that you can move between. Uh, I can very quickly show you the uh, blueprint as well, if you'd like to have a look at it. Um, so at the start, we basically create all of our instances, right? I'll just make sure that my screen is correct. Uh, so we create all of our instances um, by basically adding an instant static mesh component and then setting that to a, to a value. And each of these is a representation of those meshes that we're accessing, right? So we need a wall, we need a corner, we need a, a window, um, and we need a floor piece. So we create all of those instances. And then for this grid, what we do is we get the actor scale, so our, our scale in world space, and we use that to decide how big our room is going to be. So we truncate that to create an integer, and then we loop through. So if we have a, a scale of four in x and eight in y, then we will get a you know kind of four in this x and, and eight in here, and it will basically iterate through zero, one, two, three uh, for four, and then zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, for the for the eight. And then we need to figure out a bunch of stuff, right? So we need to know whether this thing is a corner. We need to know whether it needs to be a wall or a floor. Um, so I've created a, a little macro that basically just figures out that stuff for you. So 
Um, we just need to know if it's a corner, am I zero in any of my axes or am I, um, uh, or am I the last value in any of those axes, right? And that way I'll know if I'm a corner in any of those values. Uh, and if I am, um, then I know which side I need to place based on which of those values is, is zero or not. Uh, and then I can kind of figure out those wall pieces from there. Then I need to figure out my corners, like I said. Uh, and then we also need to figure out if we have a door. So we basically have a, an array of all the doors that are inside that level. And it's just going to run through those doors, figure out whether it, um, it lines up with it, and then removes those pieces and doesn't draw them. If it's a floor, then we add the floor instance. And if it's a wall, we can add our walls, which is just over here. So we have our wall meshes there, we have our corners here. Basically, all we're doing is we're just adding an instance of that particular type. Um, and then to figure out the transform, we just have our X and Y values, which give us our positional space. Um, our wall offset lets us know how much we need to scale that by. Uh, and then our rotation is basically figuring out whether we're kind of like a north facing, south facing, east or, or west facing, and that will let us uh, pick our, our sides. So we have that blueprint just built in. You can go and you can download that and, uh, and pick it apart and have a look at some of my blueprint. Let me know what you think of it. Uh, same with the corner. So we need to know whether you know kind of we've got a, a corner piece or not in those sections. And that gives us our room. So it's basically just going to go through. If we imagine that this is zero zero, and then this is you know kind of our last value last value, it's basically just going to run through each of those one by one and go. Am I a corner? Yes, I'll put a corner down. Next one. Am I a floor? No, I'm a wall. And then it puts down a wall. And you just keep on running through that uh, through that list. And that lets you create these really cool, unique, uh, unique structures. Like I said, we didn't end up using it um, for this one just because um, we wanted to keep the space no, we, reasonably tight and controlled. Um, we but, used it yeah. for the middle for the middle part. Um, so yeah, yeah. This test area in the middle that that's um, that's where we used it. Yeah, because at, at the beginning, um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I had to laugh. More spaghetti, please. <laughs> um, uh, when we, when we started, we had kind of different levels. We had a test level, and we had um, uh, we had a test level, and we had uh, uh, this uh, this big level, and then we consolidated and said, let's put everything together, and that's uh, where the room we, we made this room, and then I moved all those test pieces here, so like uh, the crates where we started with experimenting with uh, how much force and physics we we want to have, and then then going to the interactive uh, to the interactive parts or the, the platform movement um, and stuff. So we brought this together, and then Aaron made this room component, which was really really handy. So uh, and we also wanted to show um, um, we we wanted to make people think about that. If you work on a project, very often you have stuff you can reuse. So it's very handy to make it into. In this case, it's a content plugin inside of uh, of our project so it's just to be uh, clear it's not an engine plugin uh, where you go here plugins and 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 uh, and, aid, and enable it um, it's a content plugin so we actually just took the folder of the stuff and made that a plugin um, so now we could easier migrate that to to another project to see this by the way you have to go to to the folder settings and uh, have enabled show plugin content if it doesn't it doesn't show up um, so yeah, it's uh, it's nice. Very okay. great. That is a hidden gem. You... Yeah, it is. So it's 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 uh, we didn't feature it in the video so much, uh, and it is uh, it is used. Um, but I thought the stream especially is a good place to to talk about that. Yeah, and I mean, if you have doors, you make have to make them interactive. So maybe I can talk about the interactive part. Um, because what what we wanted to do is um, we want to give people the ability to very fast make more pieces if if they want. Um, so 
we started thinking of okay we normally what you very often see especially in beginner tutorials is um is casting around or like having a very complex hierarchy of i have a base interactive object and then my door is a is a child of that and then the functionality is there but then suddenly you do something that's a bit like a door but a little bit different and then then you end up with this hierarchical uh, mess. So we wanted to avoid that and wanted to show a little bit how you could do a more solid and more sustainable and expandable um, and more flexible system. Um, so uh, we made an interactive component. So when we when you take a look at the, uh, at the character, you have all these components the character comes with. Um, I mean, one of the simple one is a static mesh or a skeletal mesh or a Niagara effect or whatever. But so that's all the stuff that comes with the engine. Um, but you can also make your own. So we made um, an interactive component. And this interactive component should be kind of the interface so the stuff can talk with each other in a, in a more cleaner way and a more easier way to um, um, to... Yeah, in, in an easier way to debug, in an easier way to to just slap it on other things. And when you have a door and a trigger and an elevator, um, it's very different things, and you want them to react differently on stuff. So, um, yeah, that's the reason why we made this interactive component. I will briefly show that because it's actually super simple. Um, it has some events um, uh, you can call from outside. And then it does something, and then um, it has an event dispatcher crying out into the world, hey, this thing got toggled. So, for example, you have two things. You can enable that you can interact with an object, and you can disable that you currently can't interact with an object. And that's stored in a Boolean uh, interactable. And then after, when this is called, it's uh, calling a toggle interactivity, which is an uh, event dispatcher. And any external um, object or whatever, actor, whatever you want, can assign themselves and, and listen to this and say like, oh, this got toggled, so I do something. So it's very abstract when you when you think about it. But, but yeah, as I said, you can just say like, you are interactable and you are not interactable. And then there's interaction itself. So you can start an interaction and that just is looking like, oh, can, can someone interact with me? If true, then I say, I'm whatever I was before, but now um, um, I, I toggle the interactivity and I again, shout out into the world hey uh, uh please I, I i um i got enabled to do something and for stop it's the same so it just stops it calls out into the world that it's not um the, the interaction is off and sets the value i will come to that part later this is uh, very special for the button press but this is actually everything so there are some advantage patches and there is two booleans and and that's all um, so if you want to make something interactable, and one example is a, is a pressure plate here. If we go to that pr pressure plate, then this has this interaction component. So our pressure our pressure plate is consisting of um, uh, of a trigger box we are using to identify some something is on it, um, and then we have the base, and then we have a plate, uh, so we can move the uh, the um, the plate up and down and it looks like um, the button is reacting to uh, to it. So that's it. And then we have the interactive component. And the logic is, is, is again, extremely simple. So when something overlaps with this trigger, um, what we are doing is we are checking, is there, we get all overlapping actors of that trigger um, and taking a look if there is at least one uh, inside of, of this trigger. And if that is true, we do something. Um, the reason we are not checking here is like, especially this, um, uh, this, this uh, trigger plates, the robot can stand on it, but I can also move, uh, I can also move something on top of it. So that's a different actor. Uh, come on, yes. So it should react. I can have, an inactive robot on it. Go there, please. Okay, so I can ha have them on it. I can push this down and it needs to react on that. So for that reason, um, this pressure plate is just looking, do I have something um, 
inside of this trigger box and then I do something. The same is when there's an uh, end overlap triggered. So something left this trigger box. We again check is there's nothing, if nothing is left, we do something. And here we assure uh, already that this, um, this is triggered each time um, something is going onto it. And uh, we don't care what it is. We just care how much uh, is there. And then we have this do once uh, note. Um, so when uh, several things uh, trigger the begin overlap, um, we assure this is only happening once um, and it's only reset when nothing is left on it. That's basically the logic here. We change the color uh, and then here is um, uh, what I meant. So that now we triggering the start interaction saying, hey, um, please component, uh, cry out into the world that you got uh, uh, interacted with. And then we have uh, a very a simple timeline now to move down the plate, down and up. That's the whole logic um, uh, for the plate. So the plate now has this interaction component and the, the logic we are doing here. And then when we take a look at the door, which is something that's reacting on it, um, what we did here is first we uh, have a, a variable um, that is um, of type actor, it's an array. Um, and it's exposed on spawn. So if I, it's exposed for editing. So if I take a look at the door and the details here, now I have this area of triggers and the level designer can just add like five, four, six, whatever, or only one of those triggers. And here I put in my pressure plate. So for example, this door currently needs two pressure plates. And um, I have another variable that says like, two of those two pressure plates needs to be activated uh, so the door opens. Um, back to the door, it means like at begin play, he's saying like, do I have any triggers there? If yes, I iterate over all those triggers. I take a look at the interactive component and for all of those interactive components, I bind uh, an event on interact. So each time this component now is firing and saying like, hey, on interact, this is getting called. Um, and then I can differentiate between it's, um, it's enabled or it's disabled. So it's enabled in this case, we are looking how many, uh, we, we are counting up first the triggers. So, so the trigger amount. So we say like, okay, uh, one plate triggered, second plate trigger, third plate, et cetera. Then we check if this, uh, the triggered amount is needed and then we open the door. And opening the door is just again, the timeline moving the left and right door. Um, to the side um, and if the pressure plate uh, or whatever else uh, we have it i can implement this in, in in a button or in a lever or whatever i want if this is disabled um, then we just count down and we make sure we go not below zero it's just a safety thing and uh, store how many triggers are activated so that's basically it and now with this this very little code uh, I can make very different behavior. So the door behaves different than, for example, the elevator or um, the, um, the wind vane here or the stompers. So they, but they are all using the same kind of system. Um, or the lights, for example, the light that's getting switched on and off there um, is, is also the same. So I can make logic depending on the object, but still using the same kind of interface without even casting or trying to figure out a strange hierarchy um, of, of objects. So, uh, and for a level designer, it's really nice because I can say, oh, there are two pressure plates, but you actually need only one. So now the door, I hope it works. I have tested for a while. And it's, it's reacting already on one. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's the, interact uh, the interaction system uh, we added. And then we made like as many as we could in the given time object. So we have the button that has it implemented. We have uh, the pressure plate I have just shown. Um, and then we have a lot of stuff that's reacting on it, like the stomper, the moving platforms that begin to move left and right, the elevator. Um, and it's all independent from each other. Yeah. It was a long explanation. I hope you could follow. The other thing that's quite nice about it as well, because I generally prefer an inheritance path. Um, 
But the nice thing about the component system is that it's right there. Like you can, like you can see it straight away. So when people are opening this stuff for the first time, a lot of the time with the inheritance stuff, you've got a lot of stuff hidden because it's like nested um, down the parents uh, parent chain. Um, whereas with this one, you can kind of see, oh, there's clearly like a, an interaction component there on the actual blueprint. And you can open that up and you can see exactly what it's doing. Um, so that stuff's quite nice. Uh, it's it's one of those weird things, isn't it, where there's like so many different ways of handling interaction. And actually, interaction itself is just such a complex uh, topic. Yeah. Yeah, there were, there were a moment in the project, I even had two interactive components. I had a highlight component and I had an interactive component. And the highlight component was just, um, it had already a trigger. Uh, and when uh, the robot was inside, it was just um, uh, uh, highlighting something. It, and it means it, it spawned a widget on top of the thing. So I could slap that even on, uh, on a static mesh uh, you have in the scene, you could put this highlight thing in and each time the, the robot came near it, they were an, an highlight on top of that. That was, um, I had that for a certain time when I wanted to highlight where the buttons are, etc. but it was just too convoluted and it was not needed at the end anymore. But this is how cool components can be because you can actually make them just reacting on any kind of actor and it doesn't need to know what the actor is, what it does, et cetera, et cetera. And the actor can react on anything you put, uh, you then put, um, uh, you, 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 you react on. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm just Very seeing great. a random question about the, the, the <laughs> Uh, the tile here. This is not landscape, no. This is actually a very simple mesh I made in um, in Blender. <laughs> so, so this is not. Um, so here you go, and it has a world position. Uh, it it has a um, world aligned um, grid material. In this way, we do not have to care to place it exactly. So it blends nicely into the rest. That's fun. I thought that was landscape myself, so I was also fooled. <laughs> it was for a certain think, time in the world, world, world and we replaced. <laughs> I think it were at, at some point. And I went, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's also a bit weird to have landscape there and then have something landscape here. And it, it, it was just needed. The complexity of the whole landscape system were needed for something simple like that. We only wanted to showcase um, and it was not only to showcase, it's really, this area here was really my test area. So I was, I was doing all my tests and implementing new stuff in this kind of uh, tiny area was, I can only recommend that to everybody, just not to have, a, to have a test area where you do your gameplay tests and your gameplay implementation before you put it in big levels. Um, it just good for iteration times. I even moved. I, I'm I'm super lazy. I even I even get bored if I have to move my character too much around. So I implemented the spawn pad very early, so I can just like do this to test instead of <laughs> walking around the corner <laughs> with him. Because if you do this 50 times a day, it gets it gets annoying. So when I was testing stuff, I was actually moving moving the pad around, so I don't have to. That's the true hack to right walk there. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of landscape, we did actually have a question earlier about how you decided where to use landscape and where to use nanite. Well, that's one for Aaron. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, we wanted to use landscape because we, we hadn't used it in any of the previous demos that we put out. So Topaz, uh, not Topaz, Valley of the Ancients, that's the old project name for it, um, was was basically all mesh, right? It was it was all nanite. So so that's really great for like the high-end projects. Um, but for the number of instances that you're like putting down to to create that, it's not necessarily feasible for something that you'd want to put out on mobile. Um, so we wanted to kind of use the original landscape. Um, we did play around with the runtime virtual height field, but it wasn't quite there yet. Um, 
So for this one, we just went with kind of the traditional landscape. And if I go onto my screen, uh, we can have a look at the, the kind of the nanite view. So you can see what is and isn't nanite. So um, basically everything except the foliage and the landscape is is nanite enabled. Um, all of the the kind of the modular tile pieces that we have, they are all um, almost all entirely nanite. Uh, all of the kind of the, the set pieces here we've got, and then all of the rocks as well are, are nanite. So those rocks are literally just um, me and ZBrush just doing like a really quick sculpt uh, of a rock just to get something um, you know that we could that we could use in engine, uh, and then you know. One of the great things about Nanite is that you don't have to worry about that retopology stuff, you know, any of the retopology work. So we basically just put a really basic, um, you know, kind of rock material on, then blended it in with the landscape uh, to give us our final result. And it, it you know, kind of works for um, for this particular project. So so we use Nanite in everything uh, we could. Um, obviously, uh, where Nanite isn't supporting certain material types, so things that have translucency or mask materials. Uh, and anything that has well position offset, we don't have Nanite uh, enabled on any of the foliage. So that's why that's all rendering black because this foliage actually um, is is all you know kind of like traditional uh, traditional meshes uh, on that at the moment. Um, we also on uh, on the the mesh front we we implemented a little trick with uh, with our foliage as well. So. Um, you, you might notice this if you dig into the project a little bit, all of our foliage actually has two LODs. Um, so we have the LOD that we, you know, kind of can see right up front. And then we have an almost identical LOD that we use on distance, which hasn't got any world position offsetting uh, on, on that material. And that's because uh, for the early access release of the, uh, of the engine, um, we would run into some optimization, uh, optimization issues with the uh, virtual um, shadow mapping. So we need virtual shadow mapping for Nanite um, because it gives us really nice shadows um, on you know, quite complex geometry and a, and a really good uh, distance range. Unfortunately, anything that uses world position offsetting um, is kind of treated the same as anything that's a dynamic mesh in that it will invalidate the, uh, the shadows on that particular area as it's moving. So um, this is something that we did do for Valley of the Ancients, where the foliage, and we, we didn't admittedly use a lot of foliage in Valley of the Ancients, um, but the foliage that we had, we would remove any of the world position offsetting on distance. So you might be able to notice it on these trees, so you can kind of see it, this one at the front, that one's moving, um, but this one, these ones right at the back, they're actually static, and that's because they're switching out that, that material. So this is purely a limitation of, uh, of you know, kind of using early access tech at the moment, um, something that's being, you know, kind of being worked on. Um, but for, for now, we've got a little workaround of basically just swapping out those uh, those logs on distance. Um, and yeah, that, that's pretty much it. So we had everything was Nanite, our landscape we used as a traditional, um, you know, landscape using the landscape tools. Uh, I can dig into the material a little bit as well if you'd, if you'd like to see that. Um, yeah, Aaron, absolutely. One thing that that get, that gets mentioned quite often or asked is, like, we we mm. always show nanite for like super high poly stuff, but um, mm. but actually it also makes sense for the low poly stuff uh, because it's a general um, optimization thing and not just for like, hey, you need high poly, then you go nanite. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, if you take a look at these assets, right, like if we go to here, you can see if we start moving in and out, we're not getting any of that pop changing. Uh, and that's because this is just the highest resolution asset that it can be. So um, we're not using, you know, kind of crazy triangle counts on, on any of these, uh, you know, kind of assets uh, for these ones. They're, they're all pretty... Um, you know, pretty reasonable, but we've got Nanite enabled anyway, just because it's faster. Um, so, you know, even if it's not going to be one of these crazy high Nanite assets, we wanted to show that this stuff is still usable on the more kind of like game traditional um, assets uh, for, for this scene. But uh, yeah, uh, now we can have a look at the, Some, the landscape. Someone is material. asking about best practice about unwrapping UVs for nanite meshes. Uh, 
Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I did do a video on uh, on Nanite. It's on our, on our YouTube channel. Um, it's the kind of the canyon themed environment. Um, I'd recommend having a look at that just for some more in-depth stuff on unwrapping. I go into three or four different ways of unwrapping your, your meshes. Um, but the, the best advice I can give on that is if you're modeling from scratch, unwrap early. So um, you can unwrap right at the start of the process. Uh, and that way you can, you, you'll have a much more manageable time of unwrapping your asset. And then when you go into the more high definition, you know, kind of asset work, it will be a lot easier for you to work with um, when you're going through. You can also reconstruct subdiv levels as well. So um, if you've got kind of like a high resolution mesh uh, in, let's say, ZBrush, you can um, reconstruct the subdivisions in ZBrush export that lower subdivision out and unwrap it manually in something like Blender. And then you can re-import it back in um, and it will update that base subdivision, but you won't lose any of that detail in the in the higher resolution uh, as long as you haven't changed uh, any of the geometry. So, so you can, you know, you do want to try and work in the lowest resolution um, possible <laughs> for, uh, you know, kind of for unwrap work because otherwise it does become really, really difficult to manage and becomes quite slow. Um, the other option outside of that is to use automatic unwrapping processes in, in stuff like Houdini. Um, I try to avoid automatic unwrapping as much as possible, generally because I haven't found a good auto unwrapper that does a good job. Um, but if that's kind of like your only option, you can't do any reconstruction, you can't, you know, you've just got this very dense source mesh that you've got to work with then at that point, you know, your, your best option is to use an auto unwrapper and um, try and work with it as best you can to, you know, kind of define the seams and where they where they need to go. Um, but yeah, I have a look at the video. Um, that's probably going to be the best source for you um, to kind of go through it. I go through specifically like a number of different ways of unwrapping. It was like one of the first things um, I was thinking about when we started looking at Nanite as, you know, kind of like this way of having millions and millions of triangles in your, for your assets. And I was like, okay, people are going to need to know how to unwrap this thing as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, check out the video. So Aaron, what, what is worse, weight paint or UV maps? Uh, I love unwrapping, <laughs> so so I actually, oh, uh, I, weight painting quite well. I really like unwrapping. I find it, um, it's quite therapeutic and um, it's fun to do. It's not a, it's not like a difficult task. It's like a game, you know, just trying to find the nicest way of unwrapping each piece and then, you know. What is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I feel like yeah. I fell okay, in the minority you... here too. I like unwrapping yeah. too. I yeah, agree. It's good. I think unwrapping is more, is really more, um, you're right. It's more relaxing. Weight paint makes you aggressive after some time because it doesn't work. And <laughs> then you try to, and you weight paint again and then again, and then you say shit. And then you start from stretch and then <laughs> it's always, <laughs> I get that. So, okay. We, we can conclude weight paint makes you aggressive. You <laughs> unwrapping makes you relaxed. And yeah, it's, it can, it yeah. can be meditative. Definitely. I think. Um, often go. people who don't like unwrapping it, they you know, they, they're just not, um, they start from a bad base. Uh, so it, it, they just get more and more frustrated with it. But if you, if you, and this is why you should unwrap early, right? Because you don't want to have, if you like make a bolt and then duplicate it a hundred thousand times around your asset, like the last thing that you want to do is to sit there and unwrap every single one of those bolts, right? Whereas if you just unwrapped it before you placed it everywhere, you'd have already done your job um, and, and you'd be done. Um, so it's really about pulling that unwrap process as far back as you can uh, in the modeling stage. Um, and a lot of the times uh, I will texture my asset before I model it. Um, cause I, I kind of know what it's going to look like. I know where it's going to go. So I can, I can texture that stuff first. And then it's just a matter of just fitting it to the texture I've built. Cause I know, um, that that's going to work correctly. Um, but that, I, I think that probably takes a little bit of practice before you, before you start doing that. So what you're telling me is that I can't just select everything and auto UV it all at once. 
That's not a valid solution here. You can't. You can't. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, is that there's, you know, the, the way that the tools have progressed, like things like Substance Painter and Mixer and stuff like that, they they do compensate for for um, bad unwraps, but you will almost definitely start to see like little seams where you haven't selectively tried to hide those in the corners and crevices and, and areas where they're not going to be noticeable. So like you can auto unwrap, but you're, you're again, you're working on a bad base, right? So when you come to texturing, um, you're much more likely to start seeing artifacts and errors and, um, you know, just start and to see that kind of dodgy unwrap come through. And maybe you can get away with it with a static mesh, but in the moment you begin to do any character work with a bad topology um, and a bad, un you can see that really, really fast. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know what would torture me more to do like five hours of unwrapping or five hours of weight painting. Oh, five hours. Weight paint depends nothing. highly on the character. <laughs> True. Yeah. That's true. It's okay, just a robot so what if we rocking it? away. <laughs> That's the reason why I do robots all the time. I mean, yeah, I know it is. <laughs> I don't know if anybody noticed, but all my last projects were robots. <laughs> so oh, I could just decide away. I, on that one. <laughs> I do it in Blender. <laughs> what I'm basically doing is just like I assign, oh. uh, I, 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 uh, um, I parent uh, the mesh to the to the amateur. And not even doing automatic uh, with automatic weights. I, I just do empty groups and then I select the vertices and say 100% on this bone and 100% on this bone and 100% <laughs> on this bone. Oh, nice. <laughs> this is done. Uh, uh, but th th that's interesting. I can show something with this, this robot actually, because uh, this robot is a bit different when it comes to that. Let's go to skeletal uh, mesh for a second. Um, so when when you when you take a look at him, um, we wanted him to be able to be used in other projects and retarget and stuff easily. So he actually follows the mannequin uh, hierarchy. So he's exactly the mannequin hierarchy, which is not, which 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 was a, um, um, it, it was a difficult choice for especially for the spine because what we did here when you when, when you take a look the spine he's actually bending so he is soft weight painted here so he um and the reason we did this so our own animations are all going with spine one so we we are basically uh the animation he comes with um his his body st stays quite rigid um but if you retarget something onto him then it really can happen that he's he, he has a little bit of this bending that was the compromise we did um for for a game for a game project, we for our own game project, I wouldn't have done that. But we wanted to have him as flexible as possible, so you can just use anything you find on the marketplace and slap it onto him, and it it should just work. Um, so yeah, but um, but normally I I really prefer <laughs> I really prefer robots <laughs> for for the weight painting part. That's the main reason. If we do uh, if we do another game sample, I think uh, we should all make Andreas do organic character rigging for the entire. <laughs> but the chat, then the let's go really. What game we do? <laughs> <laughs> but then let's let's go really extreme because you can you can do the other extreme and you do like tentacle monsters where you also don't care anymore <laughs> how it bends because it just bends in all directions. That's also fine. <laughs> Yeah, but we'll maybe do all of the stuff as well individually. Or I do a robot and then I use the first system to just fake that there, there's movement, you know? No, no cheating on this one. Highly yeah. realistic yeah. organic character. <laughs> oh gosh. That's the rule. Yeah, I, I, I... <laughs> I, I did this dragon. I did this uh, this this dragon, but I had help from Aaron there as well. So I always rely on Aaron to do this organic stuff and foliage and all this, I don't know, stuff that bends. That's, uh, <laughs> complicated, complicated <laughs> things. Understandably. Yeah. It, understandably. Before we get too far away from the landscape and stuff that we were talking about before, there was a question that came up 
um, since you were talking about how you did most of your actual experimenting in that level that you were showing, um, your recommendations for that, right? If somebody's working on a larger environment, would testing in that environment cause too much bloating, make the map size and performance tank? Would you recommend they do something like that in a smaller environment and then translate it over? Or do you think it's fine to just tinker? Yeah, I mean, the main reason that we put that, um, you know, kind of little sandbox in the very center is, is, is because the map, right, is, is that that is the play space that everyone's working in. So um, I would definitely recommend having your having separate um, play spaces for testing out content. Um, one reason being that, uh, you know, you can reduce checkout contention um, if you're not using one file per actor. Um, it's very easy to strip that stuff out if you're, you know, if you're working uh, separately. Um, and then also, you know, you've just got your own little sandbox, right, where you can you can mess around, and you can edit stuff, and you don't have to worry about, you know, kind of that suddenly breaking <laughs> something somewhere in the world. Um, and then also, when you're if you're working in a really big uh, level, depending on how big you're going, um, you know, you you might not be able to stream all of that stuff in at once, right? Like it, once you get to a certain scale of, um, of world building, especially with world partition, um, same was true with world composition, is that you literally won't have enough memory to store all of the world loaded in at once, right? So the way that you have to start working once you get to a certain level of scale is you basically just have to load in the cells you want to work in which might be, you know, kind of like four or five or whatever. And then you just work in those cells and you, you do the work you need to do and then you save it, you unload them and then you load in some other cells and you start working in those instead. So I definitely put your, you know, your sandbox environments into separate, into separate maps. Um, it'll also save on any processing time as well. Like if you, if you open up that big map and someone's made some changes to the landscape and it's suddenly got to generate like, 20,000, 30,000 different shader permutations. You don't want to have to sit through that what? Um, when you're not never happened. To <laughs> <laughs> I feel yeah. like we touched no, a source. I think you're always, when, when you work on those projects, uh, whatever you're working on, um, you have to think about iteration times. So that's what I really meant with a, with a, with a spawn pad. It might be funny to just move around the spawn pad to get closer there, but if you do it like 40 times and you have to walk each time 10 seconds to your spot where you want to test something, I mean, add it up. So if you do this 50 times a day, that is like 50 times 10 seconds. And then suddenly we're talking about an hour where you just walk around and don't do stuff. And that's the same for modeling and that's the same for everything. So I think you should always think about your iteration times. It's so easy to say like, ah, I don't do this or don't do this convenient function yet because I don't need it. But very often in my experience, it's it's good to be lazy. <laughs> it drives you to the point that you kind of optimize this kind of stuff. Um, you heard it here um, first. It's good to be lazy. So um, <laughs> Aaron, there's do one a thing on the landscape. landscape. Um, sorry, go on. I just want to say there's one more thing on the landscape that's maybe worth showing is the um, virtual texture and blending uh, the rocks into the landscape. I think that's, yep. that's a good one to show as well. Well, why don't you switch over to my screen and see what I've got up? <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. It's like we plant this. Got, yeah. Um, so this is the, this is the landscape uh, material. So, um, it's one of the big things I always try and push. Like I, when I see people building landscape materials, they they will often end up with a really big spaghetti uh, spaghetti mess. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't need to be that way. You can you can blend um, you know kind of much better ways of, uh, of blending this stuff. So the way that uh, I generally tend to work is by blending material types rather than blending individual textures, right? So what I often see is you'll get the, um, the layer blend and they'll do that for diffuse and then they'll have all of the different diffuse maps for each of the types they're doing. And then they do the same for roughness and then they do the same thing for, uh, for normal and things like that. Whereas actually you can feed uh, functions that are representative of entire material attributes, so things like this, directly uh, 
together. So, so you can blend all of those. And you can do those using the landscape layer blend, or you can do that using uh, material function blending uh, as well. Um, so I highly recommend you you start looking into into this way of um, of blending your landscape data. The only thing you just need to be careful of is making sure that each of these material functions has uniquely named um, you know uh, values in them. If they have the same value name, then they'll uh, they'll be kept as the same value for each one. Um, and that can mean that you'll have kind of conjoined uh, values for a lot of this stuff. So the way that I tend to work is I've got my base uh, layer blend in here, and that feeds directly into my landscape um, material. But then I also feed that data into a vir runtime virtual texture output. And this is a, uh, a, a virtual texture that we've got in our scene that allows us to basically read what the landscape is looking like and the landscape height uh, at any you know kind of any point in the world. So as long as it fits uh, within this uh, this volume that we've got here, uh, so this kind of this play space over here, um, we'll be able to see it. So I think if we do, uh, I've got my RBT in here somewhere, right? So I've got to try and find it. <laughs> Too many rocks. There we go. Runtime virtual texture volume. So we've got this this volume that basically represents the entire play space, and that's basically giving us kind of like a, a vertical um, capture of our landscape. So you can kind of see it in here and here um, where that's feeding in. So we're feeding that data into the virtual texture, and then anything else in our game can then read from that virtual texture. So if we take a look at some of our uh, some of our rocks. You can see that they. Aaron, they which are, resolution they have does it have? Say again, sorry. Um, what, what resolution does the virtual texture has, have? Oh, uh, do you know? I can't remember. I can double check. Um, so we're at uh, eight two five six um, tiles. Okay. So uh, it's you know it's it's like a reasonable size uh, that we're using. Um, and this is basically blending it in, right? So this is how we get nice soft blends uh, for any assets that we want to do. And it means that we can get these kind of nice rock protrusions, um, and the blend will give us that kind of uh, that, that nice soft effect. And I can show it on the other end as well. So if we go to, uh, we just find one second. I just need to find the rock. Uh, nope, that's the original. There it is. Uh, so basically, we've got our RVT here. So all we need to do is um, specify. Let me just do that. All we need to do is specify our runtime virtual texture uh, inside here. Uh, output our world position. This is going to give me the position in space for for where that texture is going to read. And then we just lerp between our runtime virtual texture and our original rock texture here. Um, and that's just going to give us a nice blend between the two. Uh, and you can see that we're using um, a named reroute road, a node here. These are so useful. Um, they got added in, I think it was 426 or 427. Um, and basically, they just let you kind of separate out your work. This was actually a community ad. Uh, I think um, that we that we accepted a pull request for, um, but basically it allows you to just kind of like node off this stuff, and in essence it's actually just like a hidden line. So the reality is, is that they're just going to there, um, but the wire is hidden, um, and it just lets you basically create these little subsets of uh, uh, of, of code right for your for your, uh, for your material. Um, but anyway, all we're doing here is we're basically doing a distance blend. So we grab the height data for our landscape um, in that's stored as a virtual texture. We get our world position, and we mask out B because we're only interested in the height variances. We subtract those two together, which gives us a, a localized value. And then we divide that by X. So, so the division is going to give us the gradient distance we want to work to. You might notice some parallels between this and the grass. Um, and then we do a power of, and that's basically going to let us kind of like add a multiplicative effect to the uh, to that to that blend. 
saturate to lock it between zero and one, and then we can output it out to give us our, our gradient. And that's going to give us that nice mask between those, uh, between those two. So um, we've got our standard landscape, and then that's output to the RVT, and the RVT uh, is, is pulled in by loads of different meshes to give us a nice blend. You can even see that we do it a little bit on here as well. So um, when we kind of, the um, stonework kind of reaches the edge of this, um, uh, the ground, we kind of blend in a little bit of a, uh, a sand effect. And again, we could, you know, kind of do a lot more with this stuff, but just to kind of uh, so sh so, uh, show some simple examples of that working through. Um, and then the last thing is just the GPU grass spawn. So we've got a little bit of GPU grass spawning uh, on here. So that's actually handling all of this, uh, this grass that we've got here. Um, you can see that we get a little bit of excess here on the top where it does it. Um, that just means that we just need to flush the cache uh, on uh, on that. So if we do, uh, if it's grass dot flush cache, boop, it will just uh, get rid of that stuff. So uh, it means that we've got the nice blending on on all of that stuff, and we don't have to sit through and manually paint in uh, all of this grass position. And, and that's yeah, really that's cool the material. Because, Again, this is kind of this level of detail thing. So if you don't have that and everything else is kind of already kind of polished and go further, then, then it's very, it was very visible, for example, that the buildings are kind of, yeah, just like slept in or like the, st the rocks, especially when you don't have that blend, they, they look so isolated. So it's really, mm -hmm. it's really cool. And it's not yeah. too complicated well, to do. So that's it. So. One other thing I'd say as well, um, I see a lot of people when they're building landscapes, they make them fully dynamic. Um, so, you know, kind of when they sculpt, it automatically grabs like the, the normal value of the surface. Um, and that makes it really easy to work with. Um, but the downside of that is that you're losing all of the kind of the back end optimization that um, Unreal is doing uh, to, to make that that scene run through. So one of the big things that we get a lot of jokes about is shader um, compile times um, for, for Unreal. Um, and we get some funny screenshots where people post up, you know, kind of like 90,000 shader permutations or something like that. Uh, um, the, and the best one is a cat. The be best yeah. one is a music with a... Do you know which one I mean? I think so, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, the guy with the background who's... Uh making the drums, and then there's a cat, and then you have shader compile. That's my favorite <laughs> meme. Yeah. Um, but often that's, that's Let's see if Unreal Engine has a link for that, because uh, Unreal Engine account is on fire today with a lot of links and stuff in the chat. So this is a challenge now. But yeah, the um, sorry. So often when you see those those big numbers come up, it's often because of a landscape, right? Um, and and generally the way that the landscape material works is that it tries to generate as many shader permutations as it needs um, to give you as an optimal um, landscape per chunk. So uh, if we have a quick look at the at the scene. Um, we've got the, the landscape here, and you'll notice that it's in sections, right? Um, it's in these kind of proxies. And inside those proxies, we have a thing called components. And I've actually, we've got one deleted here, so you can see where that section's missing. So each landscape consists of X number of components um, as, you're, as you're building it. And each of those components will actually have um, a different, potentially, a different material um, being applied to it in the background that is only using the variants that you need, right? So if you use the uh, landscape layer blend correctly, it will actually, um, when you press save and compile that, it's not just making that variance, right, with the, the four or five or six or however many different layers you're blending with. Um, it's not just making that one. It's actually making a, a new shader variation for every single subset. Um, so if you have a component that consists entirely of grass, then you will get a new shader permutation that is just that grass, right? Um, and that's much better from an optimization standpoint um, than having all of the other things being processed in the background that it knows it's never going to render. 
So you'll get that. Um, if, then if you have another one that's a bit of grass and also some dirt, you'll get another shade of permutation. Then you'll get another permutation if you've got grass, dirt, and rock. Then you'll have another one if you've got dirt and rock, um, right? So basically every single time you, um, you've got like this big landscape and you've got all of these different you know, kind of variances that it's going to be using it for, you're generating a new permutation. So, so that's why um, you'll often see those, those really big uh, shader compile times, because what you're actually doing in the background is generating like all of these different variants that in the end you do need, right? Because you're going to have a much more optimized, um, you know, kind of end product for your landscape that will be much more streamlined. It'll only have the things that it needs for each of those components. And the same is true for, well, the, sorry, the opposite is true um, for when you have that kind of dynamic landscape, right? So every time you use one of those and you have the grass on normal up and turn to snow if you get past a certain height and use rock if you're on a, uh, you know, this angled surface, right? The problem is, is that it's never gonna strip any of that stuff out based on whether it needs it or not. So whenever you're um, using that material, you're using the entirety uh, of that material rather than just the bits that you're, um, you're using and needing. So you may want that um, for the effect that you're doing. You know, if you're building a landscape that has lots of variants and changes over time and, um, you know, you, you want it to have different seasons and things like that, then having that kind of dynamic changing landscape is, you know, worthwhile. Um, but just something to consider. Uh, and if you're ever wondering why your shaders are taking ages to compile, that's that's probably why. Um, and at that point, I would work in a uh, in another scene that's not your massive one, um, which has a smaller landscape with maybe one or two components on. Um, that's going to let you kind of test that blending that you're working on without having to generate all of those permutations. Sorry to go on up on a. No, <laughs> great advice. I no, see it happens so often. <laughs> no, it's uh, and it's true. I mean, it's what what you're saying. People, you can also go to the project settings and check what per, per, what permutations you really need. So, ex for example, if you don't have any static uh, light in your scene, you can switch that off, and that actually reduces. Um, the amount of stuff that gets compiled. I think a lot of people are not really aware how you can optimize that. Or sometimes you even compile for mobile if you haven't checked that before. So you're compiling all the time for mobile, but your game is maybe not for mobile. So it's good advice to go to the project settings, search for shader permutations and um, uncheck every box you think you don't need for now. And there's That's Unreal right. Engine again with a very good video link. So really on <laughs> fire today. It's like it's like bam, 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 one link after each other, except this one link about the shader compile funny meme. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well Okay, one one um one other thing I briefly wanted to show is uh, the spawning. Um and the dissolve and how how that works. Um, so as as shown, we that that it was really important for us to have this kind of unique features, and we 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 tried different things. But as I said, we ended up with this. You can print a new one, um, and now I can make like I'm not sure how many I currently have. Uh, I think it's eight. Let's see. And the first one begins to dissolve. There it is. So. Um, after the eight, the first one you printed gets dissolved. So I could spawn more. Also do this. Um, yeah, and, and, and that that process, um, uh, what happens, we, c we can uh, start with the input. So in the moment I press F in this, uh, in this case, um, what, it, um, uh, what it basically, uh, here, so enable spawn effect, unprocess and spawn you want. So when I press F, this gets fired. So the capsule is set to no collision. So we do not want to collide with, uh, with the capsule anymore, but we want that um, everything is colliding with the skeletal mesh. Um, for that reason, this is set to no collision. The mesh itself is set to collision enabled for physics and query. 
um, and then we simulate all physics uh, um, uh, be below the head. So it's actually only the head. So if I'm running around and only keep him there, then the head is simulated. So if I go closer, I'm not sure if you can see that, but then his head is pushed away by the capsule of the of the other one, which is kind of nice. Um, that's what's happening here. Um, to make this work, uh, the character needs um, uh, let's go there. The character needs a physic asset. So um, the physic asset uh, for the characters in the rig folder. So here we are. He, he is. Um, again, very simple. So he has a body for the um, of, yeah. He he has a body for his body, uh, and he has bodies for for arms uh, and for his, for his hands, and then um, there are joints um, like here, and they are rotated. Um, so he keeps uh, he's trying to keep within this red uh, uh, area. Um, so if I if I simulate him here. Um, yeah, I can I can track him around here to test him before I test this in the scene. Um, yeah, to test if if this is working. So um, this setup um, is 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 extremely simple. So it's just those those bodies. Um, one thing important is that you take a close look on the mass, the linear damping, and the angular damping of each of those bodies. So, for example, the his belly here is a mass of ten kilogram. And then um, the arms, or the sum of everything that is um, connected to it is actually less than this 10. So this is 10, and then here we have 2, and here we have 2, and here we have 2, and here we have 2, so it's 8, um, at which is less than 10. And that, that's kind of good advice to try um, that you don't have forces that uh, pull on it uh, too much. So if I would, for example, have him here like... like um, a two and this one is length five when this one is 10 then there's a lot of force on, on on this and to avoid that it's it's what i always start with when i work on this physics assets is um making the next body connected to it half the size um so this is uh, 0 0.5 and together they are 1.5 which is still less than this one um that already um that already uh, helps a lot to get this in control. Next is um, I increase the linear damping a bit, so I don't want to move it too fast. And the angular damping I increase qu quite a lot. I want to I want not to have it like very jittery. Um, um, so that's that's one thing. And then next for the joints um, in uh, the constraints between between those. Um, for that, they are not allowed to move, so they are connected. So the linear limit is uh, is locked, and the angular limit depends a little bit on what kind of constraint you have. So here, the elbow, for example, is is locked um, in in one direction, and this, the second swing motion is limited to forty five degree, and then as a twist is also locked. Um, but when I compare that with um, with the 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 wrist here is um, uh, it's all limited. So it can move a little bit in all direction to 20 degree, like left and right and 20 degree up and down and he can twist a little bit. Um, uh, you, you have to test out what you need, but basically you have different, uh, you're, you're, you have those kind of different um, uh, constraints depending on your body. Uh, here, for example, um, uh, he has a very small um, swing limit left and right for the feet um, and a little bit higher one uh, for for that um, as way one one nice trick is if you um, uh, if you want to have this cone w where you allow movement um, uh, offset from the rest position you can hold alt and then move this and now he would try to reach uh, that angle instead of the the rest pose angle. So for that reason, I moved it up a bit he, uh, here. So you can you can also try that. And then um, uh, what also a little bit special with him is the head. So normally, if I create body for bones, um, uh, if I let's briefly show all bones. So if I would make a new bone here, um, you have different shapes you can choose from. Uh, so a box, a sphere, a capsule, 
what what fits best but you can also and that's what, what we did with a hat we actually imported a static mesh um hide bones so we imported a static mesh here so you can do right click and then say copy collision from a static mesh and in this case we got his flat head and had a collision that is much closer to his uh, uh, to his visuals um yeah and and now with uh with uh with a constraint for, with this constraint here so he keeps his head up while we um uh, while we simulated, it has a little angular motor. So uh, with a strength of 500, so he's trying to keep his head up. So in the moment you move it in another direction, it doesn't stick there. But um, if the force is away, he's he's kind of uh, um, keeping up his head. So um, that's what you can play with. Um, one other thing I think is very often overlooked when you work with, uh, with the physics assets is... Um, uh, is uh, the, um, uh, the center of mass. Um, so if you uh, if you have the primitives here, so here is the data of the capsule. Uh, I have the rotation. I zeroed out all the stuff, and but the center um, is six in x um, moved away from where the bone is because the bone is here. So um, the bone position is here, and the, shape, the the body shape is moved a little bit in that direction, and that actually makes him um, uh, that that actually makes him uh, already apply force to the to the bone because uh, he is a weight, and when when force is applied to this body, um, it's this mass, and then. I set back the center of mass uh, a bit, so the mass is not in the middle of the body, but the mass is here, uh, which takes away a lot of force you normally have. If you if you don't do that, you just assemble your your bodies, you move the bodies where you want the collision to be, but then the center of mass is also there, which means there's much more force on the parent bone than there needs to be. So this is super handy to take a look where is actually my body and where do I want the center of mass uh, to be? Uh, very often when you see jittery, jittery setups um, uh, and, and you have a, a full rectal and he goes uh, into mode, then you have this, everything is jittering a bit. Um, and that, uh, th that happens when you, uh, uh, when you have too much forces there. And it also means that you begin to counter do that with having motors uh, to ha keep it in place. And then you do really high motors. And then there's so much force that it gets really, really, really crazy. Um, so yeah, we spend a little bit of time to, to, to have a nice setup for him. So when we go back, um, so here we simulate only the hat. The rest is the animation. Um, uh, to make it look a little bit nicer, this is really some of those details you sometimes need to do to put a little bit of this extra love in um, um, that makes can make a big difference. So the camera boom, so the, the camera is um, the camera I'm moving around is attached here to this camera boom, um, and it stays with uh, with the capsule because it's attached to the capsule. So when he goes in rectal in full rectal, the camera would actually move with him. So in and I don't want that in the moment I um, I disconnect with him. So I can show that if I'm if I'm running around here and see he's actually looks like he's falling down because the camera stays where it is in the moment I unprocess him. And that is what this does. I detach uh, I detach the camera boom so it looks like the camera stays and he's falling down. If I wouldn't do it, the camera would fall down with him and and stay with him. Uh, this is a very small thing but it can make a big difference how your eye is following the actions and then we say he's inactive this is something the animation blueprint is using and saying oh you're inactive so i'm blending into into your inactive pose then i start a timer i will come to that in a second that's how we check for rectal um, and then we do stuff like we changing the material intensity um, the emissive intensity in the material. So he has this emissive in, uh, on his belly and on his back and uh, that gets switched off. And also, I'm not sure if this is really visible. If I eject here and then we can fly around, um, then you can see his face actually is changing to system failure reboot to continue. Um, 
And we do that by uh, using a material on him um, that has a flip book um, and that is driven by a scalar parameter. So um, uh, it, the parameter is called mood and then um, we can can try briefly to show that. So uh, here's a phase uh, material, uh, but let's go to the, to the material itself. So what's, what's happening here is we have this mood parameter um, and we have a flip book we are using that spits out the UVs and that goes into an atlas uh, for the eyes. So the character actually comes with 16 different facial expressions, so to say. We only use this one and we use this one. Um, so by changing, uh, by changing the mood, um, so I, I think it's easier to show here if we do this. Um, you, you can actually switch to th different facial expression. It's quite cute. Uh, so he has, uh, as I said, we didn't, we didn't use them uh, much, but you can if you use the project. Um, yeah, and this is how we easily change uh, this in the moment he's changing the state, again, to make clear that he's inactive. Um, and then after a little while, we spawn a new character. Um, so while he's doing this, uh, this timer gets started and it's looping. Um, so we didn't want to have that in tick. It, we didn't need it to be super accurate here. So um, uh, uh, every uh, 0 0.1 second, he is checking for Rectal. And what, what, this is da what this does is tracing down the character of looking if there's something world static, some physic body, some world dynamic uh, below him. And if not, we switch to, to Rector. Or we also do that um, when he moves too fast. This is something, this could be improved. This is not, it's not, um, uh, you have to get used to it a little bit because if I, if I move and then re go, he goes directly in Rector. If I stand there, he, he, he is staying in this inactive state until he would lose the ground under, underneath him. Um, yeah, it's, um, you could do more elaborated checks there maybe, but it works for now. And that's, that, that's, uh, that's how, how we do that. And uh, we could actually go, go crazy with the amount. Um, I just limited it and it's just in the data. So, um, there's no hard limit. We can go to the uh, to game framework, and then there is um, there's a blueprint function a library I made because we needed at several. Um, I didn't want to have a variable at one place and then cast and get this variable in different places. So we have a um, extra, most simple uh, function uh, blueprint function library you can do. Um, so here is the amount of. Um, of characters, so if I would do uh, thirty, for example, um, now I he would begin to dissolve after the thirty. So we can. Yeah. Any any questions around that topic? <laughs> Less facial expression than that. <laughs> Oh, what you also can see, they all look a little bit yellowish. That's the reason why Aaron forced me to use a U instead of setting the color, which was a good choice. Are you guys still there? I think we might have. Uh, I think we might have melted everyone's brains with the the mishmash of all of the things that we've just covered. <laughs> Yeah, it was a bit much. Sorry. No, no. Great advice there. The very ending was both very impressive and very depressing to look at at the same time. <laughs> this poor graveyard of robots. I have more. I still spawn. Oh, no. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, we actually coded emotions into them, so they feel everything. Oh, that's <laughs> that's a feel good note there. <laughs> and now they're dusting. Yeah. You got to wow. dust. <laughs> I'm actually surprised how good it's holding up. Could we um 
we've gone through a lot of time over two hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I, I mean, the best advice we can give, we, we mainly made the project so people can download it on the marketplace and tinker with it. And we left, we left, left so many comments and stuff. And and we are available. There there's forum posts, so we will take a look in the forum post for the stream. There's another forum post when we release this. So we, we are around. So um if, if someone has specific questions about it, we are happy to answer them, not only in stream but also afterwards. Um but yeah, download the project. Maybe Unreal Engine account has a link for oh wow, okay. You were faster than I expected. Um <laughs> Yeah, there's yeah. also we also made a video about going through all those topics. It doesn't, it didn't cover everything what we talked about today. So today we actually cut, could go a little bit deeper and show some stuff we haven't shown in the video. But um, yeah, I think best advice is to start tinkering. Don't be afraid. Cool thing with this mm. project is, I think even if you're just level designer and do not want to do the blueprint stuff, um, I would love to see people doing some puzzles just with the existing stuff and building a level and, and like, because with this, we, we had already, we had more puzzle and stuff in um, the project at one point and we had to remove it because I sucked at it. Um, <laughs> Aaron was yeah, very we, good in playing it. <laughs> yeah, we had to do, uh, we were kind of doing um, playthroughs to, to like send to people out at Epic. And honestly, when Andreas did them, it was so awful. You would spend like 10 minutes trying to jump on a pillar. Yeah. I know that I had to re re record one video where I tried to get up to the platform like 20 times or something because I didn't get there. And then I told, and I told Aaron and said, like, it's so hard. We have to change it. And he was like, what? And he was like, jump, 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 jump. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a bit depressing <laughs> to not being able to play the own game. Uh, no, but really we had we had a point where we had a little bit more puzzles and we have kind of three areas with this level instances we made. Um and they had a little bit more elaborated puzzles like you you need to to go to a certain spawn pad so you can spawn from there then you have to hold the door open so you spawn another one and you go through that etc and we figured out if you limit um we, for, for a long time as a project we had the limit of robots set to three and that limit made some puzzles really hard because you really have to think closely where do i position which one because if i spawn a new one the other got dissolved but he should have he, he needs to be on the plate so he can open the door, but you could also try to push a crate there. So actually I was surprised that was not the idea behind all that stuff, but how many different puzzle situations you could already create with standing on the head of someone to reach another platform, to reach the spawn pad um, was, was interesting. So um, it would be nice to see some people tinkering with that. I also saw that over 10 videos are out there on YouTube right now from, from different people investigating and doing stuff with it, which is pretty amazing and pretty cool. Well, hopefully there will be even more after this stream. Yeah. Make sure you tag I'm them. Waiting that the robot saw, uh, maybe um, I'm, I'm just waiting to see him pop up in a, in a, in, in a game on, on itch or on, on steam. Uh, the first time. <laughs> All right. Well, unless you guys have any other features that you're dying to show, I think that was a very impressive amount of information that we were able to compact into this. I was going to say, if we do any more, I think. Uh... <laughs> 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 yeah, that's overload. the thing. Once you have done those kind of things, it's easy to like. It, it looks so easy, but I can also tell it wasn't always easy when we made it because also for us, it's like figuring out how is the best way. You have 10 different ways to do it. What is the, what is the most elegant way, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's normal that it's overwhelming and it's getting easier, easier once you understand it. I hope we didn't yeah. lose too many brains tonight. <laughs> they'll come back it's fine brains regrow right that's how anatomy works yeah yes yes absolutely yeah. 
<laughs> for some people faster and for some people slower. <laughs> Well, so we thank should you stop here. It's, it's it's also pretty late here on our side of the uh, of the right. Uh, yeah, Earth. don't want to keep you too too long. So thank you guys oh, and so we have much to for go. coming on. Marcos is showing up, so he's a friend of mine, and we have to go. So <laughs> okay. He will have really strange questions and and stuff. So it's good time. We came just in time for us to wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate you guys coming on. This was absolutely splendid there's so many little tips and tricks in here a lot of things that people can get in and stick their fingers into and experiment with and hopefully bring some of that advice over into their own projects as well in the future or of course don't forget to download stackabot and just play around in it yourself have a lot of fun with the features and the wonderful work that these two have put into it for you to experiment with. Make sure you read those very elaborate comments. I'm sure they'll be very helpful, uh, especially for any questions that might come up. And then of course, obviously we have some of their handles here. You guys can also reach out to them on our forum post as well. If you have any questions that come up later, make sure you drop them down there. Make sure you get those asked. We'll do our best to get back to you about those and get them answered. But other than that, Thank you guys so much for being here. I have a Thank last you, question watchers. Here. Yeah, go ahead. How 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 was your stream? Because I think it was your first stream solo here with <laughs> us, right? It is. Yeah, it was my first my first solo stream, and it was great. It was great. It was good to have a, a bunch host. of laughs in there. Thank you. I appreciate that. You don't have to lie to me, but I appreciate it all the same. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Really uh, nice. Looking forward yeah. for another one. Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to whatever else you guys managed to put together between all these cool demos and stuff that you guys have done. I'm excited to see what the future holds. So thank you, everybody who watched. If you guys are interested in more, obviously, we will be coming back next Thursday as well. We've got a really good show lined up there as well. Again, don't forget to go download Stackabot, play around with it. Other than that, you can find us on all social medias at Unreal Engine. You can find these two at their handles as well. Other than that, I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of your day and we'll see you guys next week. Bye.